Okay, um, I think I'm, I'll make a start. So um, welcome everyone um, to um, our horizon scanning discussion on the future of the environmental sciences and the regulatory landscape, which will be crucial to securing that future. My name's Ethne Childs um, and I'm Communities and Partnership Lead at the IES. Today's event is part of the IES's Future of ES23 Horizon Scanning and Foresight Project, where we are bringing together voices from across the environmental sciences through discussions like this one, as we work to create a vision statement that sets out the different potential futures for the environmental sciences, as well as how we can create the kind of future that we want to see. Naturally, as with all foresight, there is a degree of uncertainty and we can best resolve that through rich conversations and widespread, widespread collaboration, which was why we're so thankful to all of you for being here today and taking part in that discussion. Um, if you want to know more about the project, um, it's all available on the IES website. Um, once we get started with the presentation, um, I will post some links to that in the chat. Um, we've already held a dozen virtual events, published 10 written pieces, and we have even more analysis and content scheduled over the weeks and months between now and the end of the year. Today's event will be recorded and some of it may be subsequently shared uh, on the IES YouTube channel. However, if there's anything at all that you don't feel comfortable saying public publicly, you can let us know by sending your thoughts by email or alternatively, um, after, after the event, please just get in touch and let us know and we can delete it from the recording. Um, just before we get started with the presentation, um, I'm just gonna launch a quick poll. Um, these are anonymous. Uh, it would be great if you could fill these out. Just bear with me whilst I get that set up for you. Hopefully you should all be seeing that on your screen now um, and I'll just give you a little bit of time um, to answer those uh, three questions. Um, we will return to some of the, um, the findings from this poll later on in the event. Um, I'll leave that up as I, as I continue with the introductions. Um, so in terms of the polls, you don't have to um, participate in them, but it is your chance to let us know um, what you think about the interactions between science and regulation, how you think they might change, and how optimistic you are about the future of scientific evidence in environmental decision making. Um, in a moment, I'm going to be handing over to our guest speaker to set the scene for us on this important topic. Um, and we're going to hear from Joseph Lewis, who is the policy lead for the Institution of Environmental Sciences. Joseph is responsible for policy engagement for the IES and working to promote the use of the environmental sciences in decision making. He has an MSc in public policy from the University of Bristol, where he specialised um, in environmental policy, and he also has a law degree from Durham University. Joseph is an advocate for transformative change and using social systems to bring together communities with science-led solutions to the interconnected climate, biodiversity and social crises facing humanity. After the presentation, we're going to um, have some breakout discussions where everyone will have the chance to share their views on the future of the regulatory landscape discuss the presentation a little bit and engage in some of this horizon scanning on the future of environmental science. As we go through the event today, please feel free to share your thoughts in the chat box. Um, you can let us know your reflections on the presentation as well as any more general comments on the topic. Um, and it'll be great to have an ongoing conversation in the chat throughout today's session. This event is set up as a meeting, uh, so we want it to be as discussion-based as possible. Um, when Joseph's presenting, please do make sure you're muted, but during the discussions, it will be great if you're comfortable for you to turn on your camera and have a bit of a discussion with us. Thank you so much for logging in and thanks to our guest speaker, Joseph. Um, Joseph, um, over to you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you, Anthony, and uh, thank you everybody for being here. So uh, I am, as indicated, going to talk primarily about how the science policy interface has evolved over time and how we might expect it to evolve into the future. Um, so there's an element of this regulatory landscape conversation, which I'm not going to talk about much, but that's primarily because uh, we're all familiar with it. We see it in the news. It's, it's particularly topical at the moment. And so I don't think that element of the conversation needs too much of an introduction. But I'm going to focus more on the interactions between science and uh, policy and science and regulation and how those have evolved. And so we'll hop right into that. But before we do, it does come with a caveat, which is that this is going to describe general trends. But the individual experience of this is quite different from person to person. There are certainly interactions between science and policy which are very effective, ones which are much less effective than standard, but this will give you a general sense of how that science policy interface has evolved. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means as we get started, but it should give you a flavour for the conversations as we as we get started, certainly. 
So first off, how has that science in policy interface evolved? Uh, before we answer that question, we really need to decide what is, what do we mean by a science policy interface? And we can start with that really um, basic explanation, that standard definitional introduction. What is an interface? Well, an interface is where two systems come together and the effects that they have on one another. And therefore we can deduce from that pretty quickly uh, that a science policy interface, the science policy interface we're talking about here, you know, it encompasses all the touch points where science and policy interact, which allow each of them to affect one another um, in, in various different ways. And so that's really what we mean by the science policy interface. It couldn't be more simple. It is the interactions between science and policy. And by policy here, we mean decision making. The rules and regulations which determine how the environment is governed, how it's regulated, and all of the um, government's approach to these, these major environmental challenges we face, but also its approach to the environment in general, and, and indeed uh, its approach to other things in other areas of the science policy interface, but obviously we'll focus much more on the environmental aspects. Um, and to give some clarity about what we mean here, it's, it is a very much a two-way interface. The first is from science to policy. So it's things like providing evidence, influencing the strategic priorities of government, shaping our understandings of the social and natural world, but also educating the public who then interact with policy, changing the way that society at large views these scientific issues, all part of the ways that science influences policy. And vice versa, the way that policy influences science funding for research, the setting of strategic directions for science, uh, the employment, the appointment of experts who then lead a lot of these scientific endeavors, but also facilitating or impeding science through the way that policy works inherently. And I think there are a few things that we can take away from this understanding of the science policy interface before we even look at the history of it. The first is that there is no single science policy interface. There isn't a room that scientists walk into where they meet with policymakers, and that's how the interface works. It's a much more complex interface across multiple organizations, across multiple processes, and across many different complex and subtle interactions, some of which are direct and some of which are indirect. And therefore, it also has to be a two-way relationship because there is a feedback loop here. Science and policy influence each other even subconsciously, even indirectly, and therefore it must be a two-way relationship if it is going to be meaningful in any kind of way. And indeed, it's a two-way relationship whether we want it to be or not. But it also tells us that it's not conscious. It's something uh, that is inherent, like I say, that it will always be ongoing, no matter how much we try and shape it or try and lock it out or push it into the process. And there's no inherent purpose to it. It doesn't exist for a single function. It has to be, uh, its purpose has to come from the things that we value as a society and the means we seek to gain from science's interactions with policy. So the public have to be a third partner in that relationship to some extent, because ultimately the society that we're part of are the beneficiaries of the science policy interface, even if uh, we don't consider them part of that interface in the immediate instance. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that perspective has evolved a little bit later on. But where does this uh, interface evolve over time? If we really think back, we can think back to an age of discovery in science where the purpose of a lot of scientific endeavor was finding out things about the natural world and developing those understandings we've talked about. But it didn't immediately have an interface with policy until that uh, relationship began to emerge. And that classical approach to the science policy interface really is this concept of providing evidence. Scientists provide evidence that is then used by government. But it poses a question, is more information always useful? So before we ask that question, what does that classical interface really look like? It looks like something where we see science providing evidence to policymakers, and then policy, based on that evidence, makes decisions for the benefit of the public. And the relationship also works the other way around, which is that the public elects and selects policymakers, who then appoint and direct the purpose of science. And that classical relationship really, for a long time, was the way that the role of science and policymaking was viewed. And to a large extent, that continues to be the bedrock of our science policy interface today, albeit with some caveats we'll get to a little bit later. But there are a number of challenges that emerge from this kind of model for a science policy interface. The first is that data is chaotic for decision makers. So I think we 
often have this perception of data as being something that creates order. The more things we find about, out about the world, the simpler things get because our understanding becomes more complete. But what we have to reckon with is that often data is chaotic for decision making. It makes decision making more difficult because once you understand that a, a policy that you've implemented actually isn't leading to the outcomes you thought it would because there are complex natural systems involved, because there were unintended consequences for that policy, because a measure isn't working in exactly the way you thought it would, it makes decision making much more complicated and it adds considerations rather than removing them. So it makes a an initial challenge for the relationship between science and policy comes from this concept of the chaos of data, which is, or, or information more generally. As our scientific understandings increase, the burden on policymakers to factor these into decisions also increases. And as a specific subset of that, the second challenge is that some knowledge is cursed. And it's, it's illustrated here with the Promethean flame. Um, and if you're familiar with the, the myth of Prometheus, you'll know that Prometheus brings fire to uh, humanity, the gift of knowledge of how to create fire. But in the process of doing so, it comes with a curse back from uh, the gods. Uh, and that's perhaps uh, 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 an enjoyable example. But there's certainly examples we can think of of where science introduces evidence and understandings of the world to policy that from the perspective of policymakers are cursed knowledge, are information that irreparably changes the way that the government interacts with society or that policymakers in general are able to perform their jobs. Things like the increasing understanding of climate change and the scope and scale of the impacts of climate change and the necessity that puts on policymakers are perhaps viewed in many instances as a cursed piece of knowledge because it necessitates action and often it comes at the expense of the other things that policymakers might want to do. And so this is a second sort of barrier to that relationship if it is heavily premised on this provision of information and evidence. And the third problem is that this model does lead to an inherent estrangement of science and the public, which is that science provides evidence to policymakers and policymakers interact with the public in terms of how to do that. And policy remains central to everything, but science and the public are often put at opposite ends compared to that initial understanding of science in the age of discovery where science is much more interactive with the public. And it's something that we lose over time a little bit with this kind of model is that there isn't an inherent relationship between science and the public in a model which is heavily premised on the government seeking evidence about certain issues and science providing those issues directly to government. And the chaos of data also plays a role here because as science becomes more complex and uh, complicated, it also uh, alienates the public because a lot of effort from science is required to provide those understandings. And therefore it's easier in this interface to only provide it to policy. And to an extent that's something that's happened over time whilst science communication and public engagement has also continued alongside it. But it leads to this inherent degree of estrangement. And the way that's affected the science policy interface over time, over the past sort of uh, 100 years or so, is that as the interface between science and policy grew, it became much more focused on providing evidence in these ways, therefore much less focused on public engagement. Secondly, it became uh, the information has provided a lot of benefits to policymakers because it's helped them to understand the policies that they're putting in place. But it's not always helpful information for the reasons that we said, both practically, but also in terms of those political realities. Thirdly, it also means that the totality of evidence in science has expanded, increasing complexity in the ways we've described, exacerbating this issue of estrangement that we've talked about. And finally, as some scientific evidence began to present policymakers with difficult decisions, it's become more contentious and led to a greater view of the politicization of evidence that we'll talk about uh, in, in the next uh, slide. And that's really bringing the conversation into the last um, 10, 20 years or so, as we talk about populism and the recent COVID-19 pandemic and the influence on the science policy interface that have come from those. Um, so what are the effects of recent history? Uh, well, we've got this uh, now infamous quote from uh, Michael Gove, a government minister, who said that the people of this country have had enough of experts. This was, of course, during the uh, referendum about whether or not the UK should exit from the EU. And it represents that view of estrangement that uh, science and evidence and expertise in general wasn't necessarily serving the public and the values that they had. And as we saw rising populism, we saw an increased presence of this kind of populist rhetoric in politics, but also these kind of sentiments in society, because evidence was becoming increasingly less of a priority for policy and decision makers, 
as other factors, values, less um, quantitative measures began to slip into politics more so at the expense of far more evidence based policy, which probably characterized the couple of decades that came immediately before that. And alongside that, therefore, came declining trust in experts. So an over-reliance of evidence in the past meant that a lot of people in society felt that it had removed their agency for decision making. There was this idea that there is evidence based policy and therefore there is a right thing to do and a wrong thing to do. And if you disagreed with that, many people felt they were being told that they were wrong and having their agency over decisions taken away from them. And therefore, they felt a lot of the time that policymaking wasn't aligning with their values. And this dual effect led to increasing populism and decreasing trust in experts alongside that. Um, and we saw that probably leading up to 2020. This was a predominant trend in people and policies interactions with science in, in a lot of ways. Um, like I say, it, it, there are many exceptions to this, but this is the general trend. Um, until the uh, pandemic came along. And during the pandemic, there were significant changes. And that's represented here by this uh, comment from Lawrence Hurst, who's, who's a researcher who looked at the effect of trust in expertise and science specifically as a result of the pandemic. And the, the quote is that although trust in science has overall increased, it's also become a lot more polarized because trust rather than knowledge is what matters. And knowledge here is understanding of science. There was this predominant view for a long time. The more science you understood, the more likely you are to trust scientists. But it's actually this more ethereal sense of trust that is what uh, leads to some people trusting experts more and some people trusting less. So what actually happened in COVID? Well, there was an increased dependence on science um, because of reliance on science to provide solutions to the pandemic, which was all encompassing because of the unprecedented visibility of scientists appearing often daily on the news to give updates on the progress of the pandemic. It was a much greater normalization of the role of science in decision making than there had been uh, over that sort of interceding years of increased populism. And it's a significant shift of the needle back in the other way. Uh, but at the same time, it led to a lot of polarization because the role of science in the pandemic was heavily politicized. It was increasingly linked to specific policy measures. Those who disagreed with the measures were less likely to trust in science in general. And this leads to what Hurst is describing here, this sense overall that whilst overall there's been this increase again in trust and expertise, there hasn't necessarily been universal increase in trust because for some people it's exacerbated a lot of the issues that were underlying in the system because this is only sort of an incremental change to how the interface is operating. It's a sudden need. It's not changing those systemic relationships. And so a lot of the problems still remained. Where does this leave us with the science policy interface after a few years of pandemic? Well, there's a lot of prolonged uncertainty, not only because there are different attitudes in society, um, not only because we don't know how long these trends will continue, but also because the benefits of the COVID pandemic heavily applied to the life sciences. We didn't see an increase in trust in environmental science, for example, in the same way. But at the same time, the public perception and polarization to things like climate science have also, we've seen the negative trend. We haven't necessarily seen the positive trend from that. And so we are seeing increased polarization. We don't yet know if increased trust in environmental science long term will be something that uh, is a trend. But it gives us a lot of opportunities to reimagine how that role of science uh, can influence policy, because we've seen very different and radical ways that things can work now. And it's really this question of can science play an empowering role rather than one where people feel that it is disempowering their ability to make decisions um, as, as a society, as public. So what are the challenges we still have when we look at the future of the science policy interface? I wanna highlight four specific challenges here. The first is limited resources and capacity. So it's very difficult when you have an enormous, more evidence than we've ever had before, an enormous amount. It's very difficult to consider that as resources and capacity for decision makers becomes more and more tightly controlled. So we have a lot of organizations, particularly in local government and in arm's length bodies, who have far less resources comparatively than they would have had uh, many years ago, but are also considering a lot more. Um, and at the same time, you've got a lot of institutional links you would need for these considerations that don't necessarily exist, often even within uh, government bodies. You don't have that relationship between science and policy or decision making, there's a level of abstraction between them. The second uh, challenge is that the environmental policy space has never been uh, more 
positively viewed. And so there's a lot more voices in that sector than that ever have been before, which is a good thing. But at the same time, it makes it harder for the voice of evidence and science to speak out over the crowds of everybody else who is involved. And at the same time, people have less attention uh, than ever before, because we've seen increasingly people get their news through social media. Increasingly, trends like mediatization have shaped the way that we consume our politics and the things that we value in our politics. And as a result, when we're looking at policy, we're often not looking for those comprehensive full views that we might have been in the past. So even as we get more evidence and things like IPCC reports that have so much evidence and so many uh, different uh, scientific um, forms of research integrated into them, we aren't necessarily seeing the same amount of increase in engagement with that evidence. The third challenge is about delivery enforcement and regulation, which is that increasingly we're seeing um, evidence factoring into policy design in some instances, but we aren't seeing evidence factoring down to the enforcement level or to the monitoring of delivery that means that we actually guarantee success. So if we think back to the benefits that policy got from science in the first place, we're actually losing some of those benefits of knowing how things work, knowing what's successful, and being able to enforce against uh, negative outcomes. Um, and then the fourth issue is this ongoing issue of politicization that we've talked about a little bit already, so I won't dwell on too much anymore. But the good news is that a lot of these challenges are already being addressed by best practice in environmental science engaging with policy. So for example, um, to address limited capacity in crowded policy discussions, increasingly we're seeing networks and communities between scientists and decision makers playing a role in helping to deal with the fact that policymakers don't have much time to engage, don't have much money to engage, by giving them access to communities who can provide them with that evidence in a very efficient way, whilst also stepping out of those very public uh, discussions where there's a lot of different voices and factors playing in to give a more integrated science policy interface. The second is uh, to deal with these issues around enforcement and regulation. We're seeing trends in monitoring and best practice. And you can see some of these in some of our past webinars around uh, data and the use of data and regulation specifically about how scientists are able to overcome these challenges with new approaches to monitoring and new approaches to evidence. And then in terms of politicization, we're seeing increased scientific literacy and lots of different kinds of scientific literacies being pushed out to the public, which is arming them with the information they need to make meaningful choices without having to focus through that very tight lens of politicization. This is also dealing with the uh, mediatization issue at the same time. So things like uh, scientific literacy, process literacy, systems literacy, carbon literacy, oceans literacy, all of these different kinds of understandings while being repackaged into toolkits, systems, and um, means of understanding the world, which are given to the public to help overcome this politicization, because it empowers them to make decisions if they have those understandings. But the challenge is that all of these solutions are just at the moment best practice. They're not yet uniform, they're not yet systematic, and they need to be scaled up and brought together. So as we ask that question, what now, how is the science policy interface going to evolve over the future? Really, there are three options and they are um, to make things, um, I suppose, uh, easier to, to see the good, the bad and the ugly. And we'll take the Western approach. Uh, the good would be a science public policy interface that integrates all three of them together, empowering communities to make decisions in uh, the policy space whilst ensuring that policy itself can operate effectively, filtering down to the bottom level, a role of science mediating between these two organisations, these two communities, as it were, uh, rather than being a single source of evidence that factors into policy or something that is abstract in understanding the world, something that's fully integrated between them. And uh, in this one, you can see the public sits on the top because the role of science ought to be to empower the public rather than to serve policy and have that work sort of top down to the public. The bad uh, would be a continuation of some of the negative trends without any of the positive ones, which is that the public and policy retain an interface, but it becomes increasingly detached and placed at an arm's length from science, which is that science is called upon when needed or when people believe that it's needed, uh, but doesn't have a long term meaningful relationship with either the policy or the public spheres. And therefore, that would be really sort of the bad outcome. And then the truly ugly one would be a total estrangement of each of policy, science and the public from one another, 
something where there's only limited engagement between each group as policymakers increasingly view themselves as having a particular role, don't get as much consent from the public, don't get as much evidence from science, the public don't trust science, but also don't trust policymakers to represent them. And science doesn't have meaningful ways to interact with and engage with either community. This would be the really ugly option, but I think we, we, we would need to be quite pessimistic to think this is going to happen because there are by and large quite good engagement points between science and policy. And so we ought to think that those will continue to some extent, even as distrust increases in some ways. But what is really clear is that we can't get to the good outcomes we want if we only take an incremental approach to reimagining the science policy interface, if we only work on slightly changing the relationships we have now, if we only think about minor changes we can make, we're not going to get to the best possible outcome because we do really need a reimagining of the science policy interface if we want to get to somewhere which is the best possible future we could have from this. And so, and you'll forgive the very 2000s uh, PowerPoint transition here. Um, I do think we need to think about a reimagining of the systems we're looking at here, not just an incremental form of change that we can take here, but a transformative approach to change, which will allow us to see the science policy interface in a new way and reimagine what that could look like and how it can serve the community whilst also providing evidence to policy. So to conclude, I think we can see then, we should all know here, I think, that this interface between science policy and the public is crucial. It's not only important for effective regulation, it's not only important for evidence-led policy, it's also vital to empowering the public to engaging in these ideas in the first place so that they can make meaningful policy decisions because the science policy interface only exists to serve the public. Secondly, we can see that public trust has become more polarized and fragmented, even if it's used in a lot of places, even if science is trusted in a lot of places, but that whilst challenges exist, modern scientific practice and modern science communication has found ways to overcome these challenges, and we ought to hope that that trend continues into the future. And therefore, there's a massive opportunity to reimagine this science policy interface as we look to the future of the environmental sciences. We ought to seize that opportunity, but we must take a transformative approach to change. Um, so that's it from me, and I'm uh, happy to talk things through in the discussion. Thank you, Ethne. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was a really fascinating overview of how the science policy interface has changed. Um, and I think some really uh, important food for thought about how that can be reimagined in the future to really work for um, for nature and people as well. Um, so I'm really keen to kind of follow on from this discussion uh, and go straight into the breakout discussions. Um, I think a lot of uh, important things to think about um, as environmental professionals, um, how we can support uh, science to empower the public is so important. So I think let's continue these conversations and, and hear from the wider group as well. So thank you so much for that, Joseph. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we're going to be moving into breakout discussions now. Um, there's going to be two groups uh, and we're going to have around 20 minutes for these discussions, which will be facilitated by members um, of the IS team. So in that case, it's going to be me and Joseph. Um, we'll be bringing you back in around 10 to 1. Um, and after these discussions, we will be asking someone from the group to summarise in a short plenary. Um, but that is, there's also going to be a recording of the breakout discussions. So don't worry if you don't capture any uh, uh, every point that's discussed. Um, we've outlined three questions to try and um, facilitate some of this discussion in the breakout room. Um, I'll drop them in, a ch in the chat in a second, um, but those are what role should environmental regulation play in the future and how should it adapt? How can we improve the relationship between environmental science and decision making? And what can we do to maximise our chance at a positive future in the context of these changes? I'm just going to paste these in the chat now, bear with me. Hopefully they've all come through for you. Um, so just uh, we're just going to move straight into those uh, breakout rooms now. So this should happen momentarily. Uh, I'm opening the rooms now. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Everyone's coming back into the room now. Sorry that if we didn't get time to finish off those um, conversations, some really uh, interesting things talked about there. Um, I will. Um, we're now going to kind of have a bit of a feedback from from both rooms, and there'll be a bit of time as well. If you didn't have a chance to say what you wanted to say. Uh, please do feel free uh, to add that now. Um, so I think probably the easiest thing, um, if I feedback from my room first, then I'll hand over to, to someone from your room, Joseph. Um, so we had uh, some really interesting discussions. And again, to my group, if I miss anything or kind of misrepresent anything, do let me know. Um, we talked a little bit about how there's often um, kind of, there's been a lot of development of great ideas and rhetoric around things like um, 
kind of engagement and, and sustainability ideas and how we kind of improve the environmental aspects of projects, but they don't often actually happen in practice. So although that rhetoric is there, that, that kind of translation into practices can be lacking. Um, and we, the kind of discussion was that without regulation, uh, costs can take precedent. And that's some of the reasons that some of these um, kind of best practice things fall off when they're not included in the regulation. Um, and in order to kind of bring teams along with you um, and to go beyond the kind of design stage when you're talking about things like planning, um, as project progresses, things can get edged out and that can often be those things that aren't required by the regulations. Um, and that regulation can be really important for um, making kind of critical elements normalized and making it the, the best practice that's done throughout, um, throughout practice. Um, we also had a quite quite a big discussion about about value um, and how you consider values, particularly beyond the kind of usual um, usual kind of financial area and how you think about things like the value of the environment, heritage, or culture and society, um, and how uh, in multidisciplinary teams sometimes that trying to talk about things in terms of their value can be really effective. You need to kind of talk the, lang the lang language of decision makers um, and others in those teams in order to kind of get change to happen. Um, if things are valued, they can often, often be perceived in a slightly different way. Um, and that understanding of language is also really important to make sure that there is a good understanding across all specialisms about uh, different things that can work. Um, we also had a, a brief touch on, on, on one of our uh, members talking about um, beyond the kind of regulation thing, there's also the th uh, thinking about how uh, for certain regulations, for example, the net zero strategy, is how other regulations can support that strategy being met. So the example provided was that um, uh, for a new building, they're looking to put in a, a heat network, um, but then when they went into the groundworks, it's it's just not really doable due to all of the kind of existing uh, infrastructure and structures that are down there. Um, so thinking about how other regulation, like things like the building regulations can future-proof buildings so that they are kind of adaptable and resilient to changes in legislation like the net zero strategy is really important as well. Um, we then talked a little bit about uh, the need uh, or the, the use of having an independent body, um, which can act as a critical friend for the government and the Committee for Climate Change was mentioned. Um, and it's better to have this space outside of an independent of government so that it can really drive change uh, and kind of act as an, a, a kind of external third party um, and, look, and look at some of the things that government are doing and how, what regulations are working and what aren't. Um, and we then had a really rich conversation about the need for, for certain skills within the environmental profession that can help um, can help uh, change the science policy interface and empower the public and policy, as you talked about in your in your presentation, Joseph. Uh, so thinking about things like media training, about being able to get stories across uh, science communication, um, getting media buy in as well. Um, and we also talked about the importance of things like risk communication and helping um, our different audiences actually understand <laughs> the issues that we're talking about, because a lot of the time these can become a bit garbled um, and uh, without, without bringing people along and, and really getting them to understand these regulation changes and decision makers won't be able to, to, to kind of meet the needs of what needs to happen. Um, so it's really about understanding your audience and reframing those messages to make sure they make sense. Uh, so yeah, really rich discussion, lots of different things covered. Um, I will hand over you. Uh, I'll let. Does anyone in my team want to want to feed into any of that? Is it have I well covered what we discussed? Perfect. In that case, Joseph, um, over to your to your group. Sure. So I, I can also feed back uh, from my group, but likewise, uh, please add in um, members of the group because I'll I'll only give a, a quick overview. And I think it's probably best summarised across the five different systems that we talked about throughout the conversation. So the first is that that public. Uh, that societal system uh, increasingly where the rise of populism, populism is one of the, the biggest challenges that we identified and there's a really big challenge there to reshape that relationship that ultimately comes from the availability of science to those non-expert public audiences but the ability as well to interpret those uh, how they how they want potentially raising some challenges and we thought probably it was it, it's a very difficult situation and very difficult to transform that but um, something that will definitely require a lot more thought to think about how we can transform those relationships. And maybe it's a degree of pessimism about whether or not we can, and therefore ultimately needing some sort of uh, long-term approach that might be able to insulate us against um, the, the challenges that come with that. And then the second we talked about really was 
we talked a lot about the interactions that science has and how science is working at the moment and how that can change. So engagement with the public being increasingly important, but not at the expense of engagement with policy as well. So something like the implementation of clean air zones we talked about, which have huge ramifications for the public, but also require a degree of engagement with policy from science. So uh, managing those sort of dual impacts we have. Um, and we talked about the tendency at times in, in our community in science to have tunnel vision or potentially to lose uh, the message in things, to focus in on, on what we might call correct answers without actually thinking about the, the wider context about this and the need to have that awareness of the needs of the public that aligns with the development of evidence we have in the communication of that evidence. Um, I think ultimately we said here that there's there's a lot that we don't know. We don't know how we can solve all these problems, but what we do need is perseverance and to keep trying to uh, put the science out there and have that relationship that is ultimately the role of professionals to put out that science to ensure that there is some kind of change. Um, and we asked, is it is it just the case that it will fall on these major environmental flashpoint events to force people to reconcile that this is happening? Um, but potentially there is still a brighter future out there if we can if we can keep putting things out. Um, and then the other two systems we talked about, which we hadn't talked about in the presentation, but I think really important contributions. The first was economics, just like in your group, Ethne. We talked about the economics of policy being really important to public opinion, because ultimately a lot of these decisions do hit people in the pocket, even when they might agree with the science, even when they might understand it. There's this intrinsic relationship between the environment and economic development that we do need to factor in. Secondly, then also media. We talked a lot about is media coverage too politicised? Because um, we all we all take the media we trust, but it always comes with a slant to it. And we really wanted to see, is there a way that we can get information to people without it having to be filtered through media or politics, really giving people proximity to that evidence um, without, without losing out on that. And then we finished really talking about the policy system that fits into this. And we were we ended on a conversation, we didn't have a chance to finish, maybe we'll have a chance to finish it in, in the full group of whether or not environmental policy should be part of this political cycle. Should decisions about the long-term future of the environment, but also the world we live in, be left to this changing political cycle? Should it be left in policy? Or should we have a more overarching approach to these kind of decisions? Um, and we talked about some examples where this has failed in the past, like the, the NIC maybe hasn't succeeded in doing this, was attempting to do this, but um, perhaps there is still some opportunity there. And that's where we left the conversation, with a little bit of optimism about maybe there's some kind of changes we could be able to make. But um, I welcome any contributions from the rest of the group, anything I might have missed in there. Great. Thanks so much, Joseph. Um, really interesting uh, to hear about those conversations. And it seems like there was quite a lot of um, similarity between some of the things we discussed, especially around speaking the right language and connecting with your audiences um, and the, the values uh, based approach, which is what you also mentioned. Um, leading on from the kind of last question that you posed there to the group, I just want to pause and, and let anyone kind of feed into that if there, if there is any thoughts. Um, about that, about whether it needs to be part of the policy process or more of an overarching uh, overarching process, as, as Joseph mentioned. Is there any reflections on that or, or on anything else that's been raised in this main plenary? Pause. I think one of the constraints at the moment in society is there's a lot of very different avenues for which you can consume information and get information and it's very very difficult sometimes to understand who might be putting the spin on it and who might be actually just telling the truth so um i don't want to obviously advocate use of any group but perhaps a, a group like full fact might be actually quite useful in terms of uh, representing data and information that's generated from research uh, in environmental sciences and then projecting that to the public because it's a known body that it's charity that um is uh reliable and responsible i just uh yeah thanks greg yeah i think that oversaturation of um of information kind of it, it's presented as fact in a lot of uh, things like social media and, and news websites but it is difficult like you said to, to to know how to look at some of this information critically so i think that's a really important point um, any other thoughts before before I um, wrap up the event today? <laughs>
No, okay, perfect. It looks like we've solved the issue of um, regulation in the environment, so that's great. <laughs> no, in all, in all seriousness, thank you so much. That's been a really rich discussion. Um, I think a lot of really interesting things to think about um, from a number of different angles about how regulation can support better environmental outcomes and also the role of environmental professionals and professional bodies as well uh, in supporting um, that science policy interface and making sure it is empowering for the public uh, and is causing the, the kind of and allowing for decision makers to make policy that supports the environment as well. Uh, so I think lots of things to think about. Um, I will, uh, as we said, this uh, there will be a recording available from this event um, so that we can kind of revisit some of these things. Um, but just before I, I go into the kind of the closing for the day, I just wanted to share some of the results from the poll that came up um, just out of interest for you guys. Um, so the first question was looking at how effective you think the science policy interface is currently. Um, there was no one who said it was very effective, <laughs> um, but what is uh, slightly more optimistic is that 60% said somewhat effective. Um, and only 5% uh, said very ineffective. So somewhere between those ranges was the most uh, common, with somewhat effective them at the most uh, popular choice. Um, I think this really reflects the discussion that we've had today, that things are moving in the right direction, but there is still a lot of opportunity uh, for change and for improvement. Um, so I think we should take that as an optimistic message uh, as we move forward and think about how some of those changes can be moved so that we move to a more effective um, policy science interface. Uh, in terms of optimism, how optimistic are you for the future of scientific evidence and environmental policy making? Um, this was quite split uh, with 33% saying somewhat optimistic and 39% somewhat pessimistic. Uh, but again, not too much on either of those extremes um, of the scale. So I think, uh, again, it should act as a kind of galvanizing force for us to try and move some of these things along that we talked about today. Um, and finally, um, how do you think the science policy interface will change in the future? Um, we had a few different answers to this, um, and this was all done in long form. Uh, so we are going to actually include this on a write-up that we do from the event. So I'll keep you hanging for there for those answers. Uh, but I think we've covered quite a lot of a lot of those things today. Um, so thank you so much for everyone for taking part in this discussion. It's really important that we get our members together and discuss these types of things. It's the only way we can really move forward and create some sort of change. Um, I also want to say a massive thank you to Joseph for speaking today and providing such great context for our discussions, uh, a really fascinating overview of the science policy interface. Um, everything we've discussed today will help to inform our work over the next few months as we produce our vision statement for the future of environmental scientists. If you'd like to get more involved in these discussions, um, please do get in touch and we can discuss how best to work together or integrate your perspective. Um, this actually marks the end of the theme on the regulatory landscape, uh, and we've actually already begun working on our next theme, as you might have seen, which is the workforce. Um, and this was focused on the environmental, se environmental sector and how it's evolving and crucial questions about its future, such as skills, EDI, and routes into the profession. We have a few events coming up next month, including a panel discussion on the future of environmental research funding and a webinar on the concept of uncertainty in the EIA process. Uh, all of these events can be signed up right to right now on our website. Um, but for now, I will let you loose for lunch today. Thank you to everyone for logging in and participating. I hope you found that as beneficial and informative as I did. Um, if you're an IES member, don't forget to record your attendance uh, in our CPD tool available in the members area. Um, and if you've enjoyed today's webinar and you're not a member, please do consider joining us as a member and supporting our work. Massive thank you to you and to Joseph. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.